Amen. Let's open up our Bibles tonight to the book of James. The book of James chapter 4. If you're watching online, let us know. Leave a comment. I want to see who all is still with us out there. And I want to tell you how much we love you and we miss you and we look forward to having you back with us. And uh, your church family loves you and we're so thankful for you. James chapter 4 and verse 13 says this. James 4 and verse 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Lord, tonight as we come to your precious word, we ask you now, Holy Spirit, to guide us into all truth. Lord, open up our understanding. Give us revelation tonight. Lord God, we pray that you would do a work in us. Help us, God, to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. Help us to put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Help us, God, to be conformed to Christ as we look into the perfect law of liberty. Help us not to be forgetful hearers, but doers of your word. Anoint and bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we look tonight at the book of James, James in these verses, in in James chapter for in verse 14, he asks a question. He puts a question to us. And he says to us this question. And this is what I want to consider tonight. He says, what is your life? For what is your life? For what is your life? And he goes on to answer it, but it is a question that is given to us to make you stop, to make you pause. To make you reflect for a moment. For what is your life? It is one of those questions that is meant to make you stop and in that moment reflect. And in that moment bring things into perspective. In the midst of a busy world, in the midst of... How many have lives that are just busy? Crazy busy all the time. And you almost feel like you can't sit down and think about what's going on. This is one of those moments. Amen? This is one of those moments where James is saying to us, for what is your life? He's bringing it into perspective. And he's going to deal with this. And in this section of the book of James, he's once again going to deal with this issue of pride. Pride that manifests itself in an independence of God. Pride or an arrogance that manifests itself and not bringing God into account in your, in your life. It is that type of pride where, in listening, even some Christians are guilty of this very thing. This is what he is writing to, where they are guilty of being practical atheists, where they basically live their life. They say and they believe in God, but God has no account on their life. They don't bring God into anything in their life. And they live this life, though they believe in God, but yet they live and they plan and they do things as if God is not there. And this is what he is dealing with. It's the same type of spirit that we find in Psalms 10. And we're going to look at a lot of verses. So have your Bibles ready, have your phones ready. And we're going to look at a lot of verses tonight. Amen? Amen. I would rather look at the Bible all night than look at anything else. Well, let's turn to Psalms chapter 10. And we're going to get a feel of what this is like. Because the psalmist David gives us a glimpse of this type of attitude in Psalms chapter 10. And we're going to come back to the Psalms and we're going to come back to the Proverbs quite a bit tonight. 
In Psalms chapter 10, verse 3 and 4, here's what it says. For the wicked boast of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. God is in none of his thoughts. He does not account God at all. He does not bring God into anything. He does not consider God in any area of his life. And that's the wicked. That's what the unbeliever does. They live their life apart from God. They don't consider God in anything. There is no fear of God before their eyes, the psalmist says. But we as Christians are to be totally different. We are to not live in that way. And James addresses this in James chapter 4 and verse 13. And the first thing that we're going to see here is our plans. Our plans. What is our life? What is our life in regards to our plans? Look at what he says here. Come now. You who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. James in this verse is speaking in particular to those who are conducting business. Those who are going about business practice. But we know that this carries application to all of us, not just for those who are in business... We see here that he is speaking to those who are making plans for the future. He is, they are making plans for business. They are speaking about what they plan and intend on doing, what they are going to do in the future. Now, before we go forward, we need to understand something, and this is what we're going to talk about briefly for a moment, that preparing for the future is not wrong. Preparing for the future is not wrong. In fact, God's Word gives us some very clear and biblical instruction about the wisdom of preparing, about the wisdom of being ready, about the wisdom of preparing for the future in your own life. And this is what we read. Let's turn back to the Proverbs, and we're going to go through several verses back there. Book of Proverbs, chapter 6. Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 6. Here's what he says. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Wake up and work and prepare. That's what he's saying. Look at the ant. What does the ant do? They store supplies. Amen? They, they prepare things. In the summertime or in the harvest, what do you do? You go out and you reap your harvest, and then what do you do? You store it up, right? You store it up for the winter. That's what, that is what has been done. You can the food, right? You prepare. You get things ready. Amen? The wise man prepares. The wise man makes ready. As we look at the story of Joseph and you consider the seven years of plenty, what did Joseph do in those seven years of plenty? He stored up for what? The seven years of famine. Because there's nothing wrong with planning. There's nothing wrong with being prepared. There's wisdom there. There's biblical instruction there. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22. Proverbs 13 and verse... 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. 
A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. You see there, there is a preparation. There is a storing away. Nothing sinful about that. Proverbs 21 and verse 31 You see this in verse 31, the horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. What does that mean? That means they get ready to fight. They're ready to fight, right? They're training. David and his men, Joab, they trained. They didn't just wake up one day and go out to... It's from the Lord. They prepared for battle. The horse was prepared, but the deliverance came from the Lord. We read Proverbs 24, verse 3. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong, yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And in the multitude of counselors there is safety. You see there preparation. You see there storing up. Rooms filled. And we come to Proverbs 27 and verse 23. Proverbs 27 and verse 23. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. What does that mean? That means take care of your business. Be a good steward of what's placed into your hand. Be a good steward. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household and the nourishment of your maidservants. What do we see there? We see preparation. We see attending to your business, being a good steward. Being a good steward of what is placed into your hand. In fact, it's sinful to neglect those things. It's sinful not to prepare in some respects. It's folly. It's foolish. Right? Amen? So we come here to James chapter 4. And we see what he says here. Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. So what is he bringing into center here? What, what is he bringing into focus? Here he is bringing into focus the plans that you make. That type of planning that you do that is without God. Where you don't bring God into anything that you are doing. And you live a life as if God is not in control. And you live a life as if God is not the one who reigns over it all. And you basically make your plans without the Lord. God is in none of your thoughts. James calls that type of living, that type of planning, arrogant boasting. It's pride. Not understanding. And here's where he brings us. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. None of us know. Amen? And here's the question that he puts forward in verse 14. For what is your life? What is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You see here, he brings our perspective back to where it should be. He puts forth this question. You don't know what is going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? And then he says here, life is a vapor. It appears and then it vanishes away. Scripture shows us this great reality. When you consider this, what is your life? It's a vapor. First thing that we must always remember, number one, is that life is fragile. 
Think with me for a moment how fragile life is. This is not meant to depress you or terrify you. But think for a moment how fragile life is. It's a vapor. It's a mist. How many of us have known people that have died in the flower of their youth? Unexpectedly. We all have. Died in infancy. How many have been in circumstances, situations where no one, listen, you never expected to get that call. You never expected. You never expected. Life is fragile. It is fragile. Remember being in high school and we had a, a friend and one of the saddest funerals I've ever been to. My 17-year-old friend in high school went out partying one night, jumped a bridge on a creek, him and his girlfriend, and the next day, listen, it's not meant, to, it's just meant to make you consider life is so fragile. And this is what James is bringing into focus. What is your life? We're one heart, one moment away. One moment. Life is fragile. We see, secondly, when he speaks of life being a vapor, that life is short. Life is short. In the end, in regards to eternity, life is so short. Life is, a, is short. It is a blip. It is a speck in time in regard to eternity. Your existence on this earth, your life lived out on this earth, no matter how long you live, no matter how many days God gives you in His sovereignty on this planet is short in regards to eternity. Amen? Life is short. Turn with me to Psalms 39. Psalms 39. Verse 4. This is David's prayer. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Indeed, you have made my days as hand breaths and my age is as nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best state is but a vapor. Selah. Selah. A man at his best state is but a vapor. Lord, teach me to know my days, to know my end, to measure my days, that I may know how frail I am, that I may live always in dependence of you, in dependence of God. That I may know how frail, that I may know day by day how fragile, how short, that not living in fear or in terror, but understanding that God is in control of it all. And when I make my plans, I bring him right down into it. Man at his best state is but a vapor. And we read in Psalms 90. Psalms 90 and verse 9. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our, year, our years like a sigh. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days 
that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Psalms 103 and verse 14. Verse 14, it says, For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. Life is short. Life is short. Teach us to number our days. What is your life? What is your life? Or what is your life? It's fragile. It's short. Thirdly, death is unavoidable. I mean, you realize that tonight. Death is unavoidable. The only way we will not die is if Christ comes back in our lifetime. That's it. Those who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's the only way you will not die. That is it. Death is unavoidable. Ten out of ten people die. A hundred out of a hundred. A million out of everyone will die. Is appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. And this is the perspective that James is bringing. When we understand that, when we understand that reality, how can we live a life where God is in none of our thoughts? When we understand how fragile, how short, how unavoidable eternity is. We're, we're all marching that way right now. Every one of us, we are all marching toward eternity. Right now, life is a vapor. It's a puff. It's like that steam rising off your coffee in the morning. That's how quick it is in regard to eternity. I can't believe I'm 36 years old. Still young compared to some. Old compared to others. But it has gone by so fast. Amen? And I hear it goes faster the older you get. Life is a vapor. Amen? And James here is bringing the perspective back to where it should be. And we see in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. And here is the proper position that we are to live under. Here he says we are to realize our proper position, realizing that God is ultimately over it all. God is in control of every single area. It is all subject to his will. It is all in his hands, not mine. Amen? You realize that tonight. David said our times are in his hands. Our times are in his hands. That he is the sovereign Lord over your destiny. He is the sovereign God over your life. Whether you submit to it or not, everyone, everyone, everyone is under his dominion. Whether they recognize it, submit to it, and give, bring him into account, he is over it all. This is our proper position, and we always need to be mindful of this. Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, and here he is speaking of those who live their life and don't bring God into account, who live their life and they don't bring God into every area of it. They live their life as if God does not exist. And we, we see this all around us. We see this. There's everything around us. They have removed God from it. 
You go to the UN and they have every single flag of every nation that is a part of the UN, but God is nowhere around, is he? They, they bring all of these plans and all of these schemes with the UN, and God is nowhere. There's now a movement that has been uh, all along in this nation that wants to live as if God has nothing to do with society whatsoever. They want to kick God out. They want to bring God out of everything. And they say, don't impo impose your morality upon on us. And I would say to them, don't impose your immorality on me. The of the universe. And if the church and God's people act like he has nothing to say to the culture, then don't be surprised when the culture kicks him out. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 12, Jesus speaks about this very thing. He says in verse 13, verse 16, I'm sorry. He said, then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. You see those plans, right? Then he says in verse 20, But God said to him, Fool. Ooh, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Christ in this shows us the futility of a life that is lived without regard for God. He says here, you are a fool. He says to that rich man, that man that made all these plans, that had all these riches, that built bigger barns, that stored up all of these things, and he says to him, you're a fool because you did not bring me into it. You did not bring me into account. This very night, your soul will be required of you. You are going to die this very night. Then, whose will that be that you have prepared for? And here he says to us, Here's how we are to live. And there's a lot of people, and I want you to understand, there's a lot of people that have said, and I may get off on a tangent here, but I've had people say to me that you should never say if the Lord wills. That's a sign of a lack of faith. And I just look at them and I go, where are you getting that? You read about the Puritans who, after everything they wrote, if they wrote a letter, they would put Dio Valente after everything. Dio Valente, which means Lord willing, if the Lord wills. You read here about James. He says, what should we say? Instead, you ought to say, what should we say? If the Lord wills. And we shouldn't say that, and that phrase, that little phrase, I know, can become just another saying that we use. But we should genuinely say that with sincerity, if the Lord wills it. Because what are we saying in that moment? What are we saying when we say, if the Lord wills? We are recognizing He is the one that is in control over our life. We are recognizing that He is the one in charge. We are recognizing that He is the one who rules. We realize tonight, and I want us to understand that you and I, we live with a totally different perspective from the world. You understand that? You and I as God's people, listen, not to, not to be like what the psalmist said, where they said God is in none of His thoughts. 
But you and I live with a kingdom perspective. Everything that we do in this life is with the kingdom in mind. Everything that we do, no matter what it is, and this is what we need to understand. Listen to me. As A.W. Tozer said, he said this, There is nothing secular in the life of the Christian. Everything that you do is sanctified unto God. Everything that you do is as unto the Lord. That means your marriage is as unto the Lord. How you raise your kids is as unto the Lord. When you go to work, it is as unto the Lord. Everything that you do in life is sanctified unto God. You don't do anything where God is not to be the one involved in it. Amen? Everything that a believer does is sanctified unto God. It doesn't matter if you're washing dishes, scrubbing the floor, cleaning out your car. Everything is for the glory of God, for the child of God. Amen? Amen? When you understand that, does that not bring everything back to where it should be? Because this is exactly what the Apostle Paul says, do everything what? As what? Unto the Lord. Do ev- you don't listen, you don't have your religious time and then your unreligious time. You don't have your life for God and then your, well, I better not live for God here or bring it up here. Amen. Everything that is in the life of the believer is as unto the Lord. It is sanctified unto Him. Amen? And when we understand that, does that not do something in you to motivate you in a totally different way? That's why the Apostle Peter would say, Bondservants, obey your masters. Knowing that you what? Serve who? The Lord. You and I, we look at things through a totally different perspective. Jesus said in John chapter 18 and verse 36 when he stood before Pilate. And Pilate said, are you a king? Are you a king? And he was. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. But what does he say? My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world system. God's word tells us. That we are to do what? In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That is, if we keep the kingdom of God at the forefront of our life, keeping it in the perspective, even while we're planning, even while we're doing the things that God calls us to do as stewards, if we do it under the reign of the kingdom... He will make sure we are provided for. One of the most famous verses that we quote all the time. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways, what? Acknowledge Him. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. In all your ways, that is in everything. In all that you do, acknowledge Him. In all that we do, we acknowledge Him. We're not practical atheists. We don't confess Christ when we're in the church house and then go out here and live as if the Lord is not involved in everything. We acknowledge Him. In all of our ways, and he shall direct our path. Psalms 37 and verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. Amen? The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And this is something to understand. If I'm living for him, a lot of people view the will of God as if it's some magical, mystical thing that you have to figure out what it is and... God's always trying to keep it from you. That's not true. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. That is, if I am seeking the Lord in my daily life, if I am living for God, if I am pursuing God and living and putting Him first, He will order my steps. 
Amen? He will direct my paths. If I acknowledge him in all of my ways, if I bring him into everything, he will lead me. He will guide me. It's only when I get off and want to do my own thing and live my own way that I get into confusion. Amen? But the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And it clears up a whole lot of confusion and heartache. If I am seeking after him, putting him first, acknowledging him in all of my ways, he shall direct my paths. James tells us what we are to say in verse 15. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. Verse 16, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. And here we must remain in a position of humility before the Lord. He says to us, we boast in our pride. And all such is evil. It's sin to live in such a way as if we are in control, as if we rule, as if we are the ultimate deciding factor. There's a story that we read in Daniel chapter 4. Turn with me there. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the ruler of the world. Conquered. He had the palace in Babylon that was said to be the city of Babylon was impenetrable by any army. They had the hanging gardens, which was one of the seven wonders of the world. The Babylonians had the most powerful army of the time. They conquered Jerusalem. God used Nebuchadnezzar to judge his own people to the point where they came and surrounded Jerusalem, besieged it, broke down its walls, burned all the houses, and destroyed the temple and carried away captives. Daniel is carried away captive, and he's the one that wrote this book, but we read a narrative about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream where this tree grew up, and it flourished, and the whole world was filled with this tree. And then an angel came and chopped it down. He had this dream, and he goes to Daniel and asks him, what does it mean? And Daniel says, that's you. I wish it was about somebody else, but it's about you, Nebuchadnezzar. He tells him, Nebuchadnezzar, you need to humble yourself. You need to humble yourself, Nebuchadnezzar, and here's what happens. Not that long later, 12 months later, after he has this dream, here's what it says in verse 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power? For the honor of my majesty. While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses." That very hour the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. He lost his mind. He was driven to eat grass like an animal. Here's what it says. And that seven times, people believe, is seven years. Some people believe it's seven weeks that this happened. But whatever it was, it humbled Nebuchadnezzar. And here's what it says in verse 34. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. 
He literally went insane. My understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and His kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to His will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth no one can restrain His hand or say to Him, What have you done? All such boasting is evil. Amen. Comes back to what James says, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Verse 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. When we recognize our position before the Lord. And then lastly, verse 17. Therefore to him who knows to do good. And does not do it. To him it is sin. Here James shows us that sin is not just the willful act of disobedience. Sin is not just the willful act in committing disobedience. Sin is knowing to do good. Knowing what to do and not doing it. The sin of neglect, the sin of omission, the sin of apathy where you know the right thing to do, you know what you should be doing, and you don't do it. To him it is sin. We read in Psalms 19 the prayer of the psalmist, and this is... My prayer on a daily basis. Psalms 19, David says, Who can understand his errors? Who can understand his errors? That means that sins that you commit and you don't know what you're doing, you don't understand it. Then he says... Cleanse me from secret faults. Cleanse me from secret faults or secret sins. Those sins that we don't know. That's why we pray prayers like, Search me, O God. See if there be any wicked way in me. We have to pray those prayers. Because as human beings, we all have blind spots. There are spots that we can't even see our own failures. Amen? There are patterns of behavior that we are so entrenched in that we don't even know that they're wrong at times. And so we pray. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. And then he goes on to say this. Keep back your servant also. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. A presumptuous sin is a willful sin. It is a sin done with presumption. You know that it's wrong. You know. And this is what James is saying. The end of James 4 Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. And we want to live a life in full submission to God. That's my desire. Amen? We want to live a life under the authority of God. Realizing, man, our life is a vapor. It is a blip. It is short. here today and it's gone tomorrow and we need to live with God at the center of everything amen let's pray tonight heavenly father we love you God God we bless you we praise you we worship you Lord father teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom 
Help us to know how frail we are. God, that we may live under your authority at all times, recognizing it, realizing that you are in control. Lord, help us. Help us to live for you, God, to bring you into account of all of our plans, even as we prepare and are stewards of what you have placed into our hands, of the resources you've given us. Lord, let us do so under your authority, recognizing you in all of our ways, God. Help us tonight, Lord. Go with your people tonight. Bless them. Bless them in their coming and bless them in their going, God. I pray that your presence would go with us and that your blessing would rest upon the people of God. In Jesus' name.